Committee of the American Security Project. And ASP is certainly glad to host this briefing with Deputy Secretary of State Heather Higginbottom on the QDDR and how Congress can engage in the QDDR process. For those not familiar with ASP, we've always felt that there were elements to our national security uh, that certainly involved more than bombs and bullets. And we certainly think that diplomacy is one of those elements. Uh, this is one of our tenets for our creation since 2005 when Heather became our first executive director. Uh, we've always had an interest in both the departments of defense and state and their efforts to become more effective and efficient. So it was certainly coincidence, I would say, that two of our founding fathers and former board members are now the secretaries of both those departments. But it's no coincidence that Heather is now the Deputy Secretary of State. Now, I've always believed that internal reviews are healthy uh, and even better when they involve a lot of external input, and that's why she and her team are here today. Uh, I was intimately involved in the bottom-up review for DOD in 1993, and later the Rolls Admissions Commission in 94, which both led to our current QDR process within DOD. I can tell you that uh, they were very painful uh, and not universally welcome. But in contrast, I believe the QDDR is off to a much better start, certainly with the first one in 2010, and now this new effort, and I applaud the State Department for their work. Following Heather will be Alex Thier, uh, USAID's Assistant to the Administrator for Policy, Planning, and Learning. Alex has been with USAID since 2010, and prior to that, was at the U.S. Institute of Peace as an advisor and director for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Then he'll be followed by the Honorable Tom Perillo, who's the special representative to the QDDR. Tom was a congressman from Virginia's 5th District and was CEO of the Center for American Progress. But I have a special guest this afternoon introducing Secretary Higginbottom is Nelson Cunningham. He's one of our original board members at ASP and is now president of Lombardi Associates. Nelson. It's a truly personal pleasure and privilege as one of the founding members of the American Security Projects Board uh, to be able to introduce uh, someone whom I have known and worked with closely and, and respect and love, don't tell your husband, uh, and, and have for many years, Heather Aikenbottom. Uh, I first got to know Heather in 2002, 2003, when she was the deputy director of John Kerry's presidential campaign, working on policy issues. I was one of those who, although not paid by the campaign, spent more time than any of my partners would care to know uh, working on the campaign, working with Heather and her colleagues on the campaign's foreign policy teams, on their international economic, economic teams. And I saw Heather then uh, as she deftly managed all of the issues that a campaign can throw at a presidential candidate uh, from from domestic to foreign policy issues. She worked closely with our then colleague, Susan Rice, who headed up the national security team, or who was deputy, actually, your counterpart. You were both the deputies on the, on the policy teams, one for domestic policy and one for foreign policy. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the end of my public service, but it was not the end of Heather's public service. Uh, she went on to work for Secretary Kerry when he then Senator Kerry, I should say, when he set up the American Security Project, he asked his trusted aide, Heather Higginbottom, to come found it uh, and to be the first executive director. A word or two about Senator Kerry's vision for the American Security Project, because I think it helps animate why we're here today. Uh, the presidential campaign was one that had him take a set of issues that he cared a lot about, which was foreign policy, and have to run it through a very political process, which is running for president. He came out, I think, truly riven with the notion that he owed it to the country to try to do something to bring bipartisanship back to foreign policy. And one of the things that he did as he took over the chairmanship of the Foreign Relations Committee was to found the American Security Project to bring Republicans, Democrats, and retired flag officers like Steve Cheney together to create a military, realistic, and bipartisan and sensible foreign policy. And he brought Chuck Hagel, he brought Gary Hart, he brought other leading lights 
uh, Christy Todd Whitman remains with us. And it's that vision of a bipartisan view of foreign policy which keeps me active with the American Security Project, and which I know Secretary Kerry keeps, carries with him today, uh, even as he serves in the Democratic administration. Uh, just to finish up on Heather, because it's quite, a, a, quite an astonishing rise in career that she's had. Uh, after she left ASP and uh, went, I think went back to work for Senator Kerry, and then she worked for another senator, Senator Barack Obama, and worked on his presidential campaign as one of the uh, as one of the top issues directors. She moved into the White House in 2009, where she was the number two on the domestic policy sphere, where she helped put together programs like Race to the Top and other fundamental reforms of critical areas, showing her breadth and, frankly, the president's trust in her. He asked her to become deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget, which any of you who have been in government know is frankly, one of the most key positions in the entire federal government. And then when her other old boss, John Kerry, became Secretary of State, he brought her in to be Deputy Secretary of State, the first woman in that role. Uh, and certainly the first person before the age of 40 to hold that role. Not quite. <laughs> um, in that role at, uh, at the State Department, she oversees not only the operations in the administration and the administration of the department. She oversees AID and she is intimately involved in the subject we're here to talk to, uh, to, to discuss today, the QDDR, with a lot of personal affection, great respect. Let me introduce Heather Higginbottom. Thank you so much, Nelson, for that nice introduction. Uh, I can attest to the fact that Nelson spent way more time in 2002, three, and four on uh, campaign work than his colleagues might uh, want to know about uh, now today. But he's been a tremendous friend and partner, and uh, I'm honored that you were here and were able to introduce me today. Um, I also want to thank General Cheney and the American Security Project for hosting this event and for all the wonderful work that you do across the board. Um, it's a terrific opportunity for us to, to talk about the QDDR, but even more importantly, hear from you. And we're very eager to do that and delighted to have this opportunity and to be on Capitol Hill to do it. I also want to thank Tom Periello and Alex Steer for joining us today for the discussion. You'll hear from them uh, very shortly. And it really is a pleasure to be here, um, both to be back on the Hill where I spent a lot of my career, uh, and also to be a part of the American Security Project event. I, I could only have dreamed when we were setting this organization up many years ago, almost 10 years ago now, nine years ago, um, that we'd have this type of an opportunity. We'd have this wonderful leadership uh, on the staff, on the board, and be able to tackle these important issues in a way that really seeks to bridge uh, differences and divides and bring people together around the important foreign policy challenges. I know Secretary Kerry uh, believes strongly that this organization continues to play a really important role in the debate um, and in the conversation, and, and we're delighted to be here today. And it's really great to be here to talk about um, something near and dear to my heart and something that we're really focused on, and, and that's the future role of America on the world stage. Um, and that's what the QDDR, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, is all about. As Secretary Kerry made clear when he kicked off the second QDDR process in April, the QDDR is about charting a course for America's engagement with the world for years to come. And that's a really important thing because with all of the, the pressing <coughs> issues that are going on around us, uh, this process allows us to take a step back and look deep and talk with a lot of stakeholders and ensure we're moving in the right direction and we're organizing ourselves for the future. All of you know that Secretary Kerry is pursuing a very ambitious foreign policy agenda on behalf of the American people and the President, from the rebalance to Asia to climate change, he's just been in the Middle East, the events in Ukraine. But what's just as important to him, and maybe gets less attention, is that he's just as focused is focused on driving innovation in the way we conduct diplomacy and development. He's the son of a foreign service officer, and these institutions, state and aid, they're in his blood. And when he asked me to take on this role, one of the things he said was that he wanted to leave the State Department and aid strengthened institutions. He wanted to ensure that they were stronger and prepared for the future. He wants to make sure that people out in the field and also here in Washington have the tools and the resources that we need, that they need, to get the job done. 
And so even as we're facing budget constraints, and, and we've all been living with those for a number of years, and in this field, misimpressions about the purpose and effectiveness of foreign assistance, Secretary Kerry wants us to relentlessly find ways to become more effective, more modern, and more agile. And the QDDR is really central to that effort. We saw from the first QDDR, which was launched by Secretary Clinton, that this process can drive lasting, positive change in the way that we do foreign policy. In 2010, the QDDR elevated key policy priorities, such as energy diplomacy, empowering women and girls, economic statecraft, and it strengthened development's role in our national security strategy. I suspect we'll hear a bit more from Alex on that. And it really helped reinvigorate aid as the world's premier development agency. <coughs> With the second QDDR, we want to build on these successes, and we want to further strengthen the way we protect and advance the interests of the American people. The Secretary directed us to make sure that the QDDR doesn't pull any punches, and it's going to ask and answer tough questions, and, and we mean that including today's discussion. We owe it to the American people, we owe it to the people who work at the State Department and USAID to lay out a vision for how we conduct diplomacy and development and to answer these questions head on. How do we stay ahead of global trends? How do we respond to the mounting threat of climate change? How do we make state and aid operate more effectively and efficiently? And how can we recalibrate our policies in an era of diffuse power and accelerating change? And as all of you know, the change, change on the world stage is accelerating. As the Secretary has said, we've gone from an era where power lived in hierarchies to an era where power lives in networks. Power, economic, military, political, is more diffuse. And it's no longer reserved just for states, nor found only in country capitals. Global flows of goods, services, money, people, and information continue to expand and the world is more interdependent than ever before. And even as more people demand that their voices are heard, many governments are reacting by closing space for civil society and tightening their grip on information and ideas. At the same time, our planet is under incredible strain, with our oceans and our air and our soil becoming less and less capable of sustaining <coughs> our way of life. These challenges and these opportunities mean that we need to deploy smart, the need to deploy smart power is greater than ever. And the QDDR, with its focus on relentless improvement, is absolutely essential. Of course, we recognize that the QDDR process can't address every issue that's vital to our foreign policy, and we have to prioritize. It can't be everything to everyone, and it's not gonna try to be. But it will be relevant to the work that we do, and to the work that we need to do going forward. We want to focus the QDDR on a few big challenges and a few big opportunities. The issues that are most central to building a platform for successful foreign policy in the decades ahead. To help us build that platform, we're thrilled to have enlisted Tom Perriello, who is the special representative for the QDDR. As you probably know, Tom served in these halls as a congressman from Virginia. But he was also special advisor to the prosecutor of the Special Court of Sierra Leone and has done a lot of work internationally and on many of the challenging issues that we're going to be able to discuss today. And he was also the CEO of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. Under Tom's leadership in cooperation with our partners at USAID, the QDDR team has held hundreds of meetings, town halls, and video teleconferences with folks around the world and inside and outside of government. And this, I, I can't stress enough how important this input and feedback is to our developing the priorities that I just talked about being so important to be embedded in the QDDR. Tom's only been on board, I think, four months uh, at the State Department and has already traveled to 24 of our embassies and consulates uh, to see candid and wide-ranging feedback. We have put a premium, and Tom's the tip of the spear on this, on these types of engagements, and we really encourage your candid feedback. I'm trying to drum in a theme here. It's not, not too subtle. Um, and they've also met with uh, over 100 thought leaders. They've met with stakeholders here on the Hill. Um, and a number of themes are emerging from these conversations. There's been a lot of discussion about how do we facilitate innovation? How do we ensure we're present and engaged in growing economies in Asia and Africa? How can we better advance U.S. strategic priorities, such as environmental and economic diplomacy? 
So that's why we're here. We want to hear your ideas, we want to answer your questions, and we want to know your thoughts and answers to three questions. It doesn't have to be limited to this, but just to get you thinking. How should state and aid modernize to be the best that we can be? What key successes have we had that we should build on and scale? And third, what trends do we need to stay ahead of in a rapidly changing world? These questions are at the heart of the conversations that we're having as we try to focus in on the priorities for the second QDDR. And if we can answer these questions, then the QDDR will be a success. Now, implementing those recommendations will be the second part of the success. But first is getting the answers to those questions right. And if we do, it'll be an important tool for our diplomats and development experts, for the president, for the secretary, for the American people, and for Congress to understand just how state and aid will get the job done for years to come. And it's vital that we get the job done. As the secretary said, the United States isn't exceptional because we say we are. We're exceptional because we do exceptional things. This QDDR will be the blueprint to do those exceptional things at state and aid in the years to come. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex to hear a bit about USAID, uh, and then we'll hear from Tom to talk some about the process. But we really look forward to hearing from you and to this discussion. So thanks again uh, for hosting us, and uh, I'd like to introduce Alex here. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Secretary. It's an honor to be here with you and uh, with my friend and colleague and occasional partner of crime, Tom Perriello. Um, if it's any indication, uh, Tom and I met on the battlefields of Afghanistan about a decade ago talking about transitional justice, and we were still debating about whether that uh, demonstrates our effectiveness or our lack of effectiveness at, at uh, addressing key emerging issues. Uh, but we're committed. That's one thing you can say. We're committed. Uh, it's really a great honor to be here. Thank you, General Cheney, and, and all of you who have come to uh, talk to us today. I will be brief because um, as, as Debbie Higginbottom said, what we're really here is to hear from you. Uh, we are in a stage of trying to understand how we can be better and how we can make sure that the wisdom that exists among the broader uh, foreign policy community is captured by what we're doing. Let me start off by saying, though, that this is not a review of diplomacy and development, diplomacy and development. It is a review of diplomacy and development together in the sense that I believe strongly, and I think that this is a vision that is strongly articulated in the presidential decision directive that President Obama put out a few years ago, uh, which is now available online, although maybe I'm not supposed to say that because it was wrestled out of us by a court action. Uh, but it's worth reading. Now that it's there, it's worth reading uh, because it is the first ever presidential decision directive on development. And what it articulates is the notion that fundamentally development is in fact part of the defining vision of what the United States foreign policy and national security policy is aiming at. And I say that because I think we all believe, this administration, the president, the secretary, believe that the world in which America is going to thrive over the next two decades is an America is a world where America is able to enjoy and take advantage of and promote some of the most important trends in human development that the planet has been seeing. We are seeing accelerating progress across the board on a number of different areas. Many of you may know, for example, that the first Millennium Development Goal that was set in the year 2000 was to lift half of the population currently living in extreme poverty out. At the time, it seemed like a reach. 43% of the world was living on less than a dollar a day. Today, or I should say in 2010, we not only reached that number, but we reached it five years early. 700 million people lifted out of extreme poverty and quicker than we thought was possible. And the reason that I highlight that is not only because ending extreme poverty is a critical goal for us, but because of what it demonstrates about the trends and where the world is going. Imagine that 700 million people who've been lifted out of extreme poverty, who are now uh, engaged in the market, who are now engaged in the demand for accountability from their governments, who are now engaged in the information age. Those things are not possible for people who are living in that level of destitution, but in a globally engaged citizenry, who I believe are a citizenry who are going to support American values and interests, is growing by the day. 
And so our ability to take advantage of and accelerate those trends is fundamentally in the core American interest. It is also the case that this QDDR comes at a pretty unique moment, in fact, in history, because those Millennium Development Goals, which were defined 15 years ago, are ending. And the world, through the United Nations, is engaging in a process of defining a next set of goals that will take us to 2030. At the same time, the world is in climate negotiations to set goals for how not only does the world continue to develop, but how it can do so sustainably. There is also a discussion about what we call development finance. And what that really means is how are we going to pay for all of this stuff? And the amazing news there is that whereas the United States just a generation ago and overseas development assistance just a generation ago paid for most of development, 80% by some counts, today that figure is only 10%. And that's a good story. It's a good story because our development assistance has actually continued to rise over time, but it's also a good story because there are so many other sources of wealth from private philanthropy, from the private sector, from what we call, again, in development speak, domestic resource mobilization that basically means taxation of the developing country's own resources and own economy. All of those things together have established a world where we have much greater capacity for leadership and leverage because those resources have grown to be so much greater. And so a lot of the reform that you have seen, really that was defined by and has emerged since the first QDDR, is about how we think about creating the tools that will unlock our people in the field to take advantage of these trends and to take advantage of these new resources. That means, for example, much greater partnership with the private sector, much greater focus on innovation, much greater focus on ensuring that we have clear articulated goals that are achievable. I think two of the best examples, and this is where I'll stop and turn over to Tom, are initiatives that you've seen uh, in food security and in energy. Several years ago, President Obama launched the Feed the Future campaign. And what was remarkable about this effort at elevating global food security was not only that it had such ambitious targets, getting 20 million poor farmers out of extreme poverty, and raising the incidence of nutrition or the lowering the incidence of malnutrition by 20% in focus areas. And what that is about is about providing people sustainable path to market. It's about making sure that children have the nutrition that they need so that they can survive to their fifth birthday and so that they can learn in school because malnutrition stunts physical and mental growth. But most importantly, the way this initiative was established is that it had the private sector, it had the long-term path to sustainability in mind from the beginning. In fact, when you look at Feed the Future, and even more recently, uh, Power Africa, the dollars that are committed to those are largely dollars that come from external sources. We are the motivator. We are the facilitator, we are the deal maker, and we do provide some important money that helps to eliminate risk, but we are a fraction of the overall appropriated resources, or, or appropriated resources are a small fraction of the overall that goes into that. And so I think that what we see incumbent on ourselves in this process is to understand how we take advantage of these trends, how we ensure that these new type of partnerships uh, is where we are leading in the future, how we deliver on results, and how we give our people the tools to be able to do that more effectively in a changing world. Uh, so it sounds good, and we have demonstrated a lot of results, but we also know that in all of these things, we have miles to go. And so hearing from our partners in the security community, in the development community, in the diplomatic community, is gonna be essential for us to be able to take the next step with this next QDDR to make ourselves even more effective. Thank you. What are the problems we need to fix? What are the successes we need to build on? And what are the trends we need to get ahead of? That's what we're asking. Put another way, how do we make sure that our overall brand strategy, strategy, and tactics do not simply reflect the fact that we did things that way last year, but because we've made a deliberate strategic decision that this is how we best advance 
the interests and needs of America through state aid and all of our partner agencies uh, all over the world. That's what we're setting out to do. Um, and I think two of the most important aspects of this QDDR have actually already happened, and the rest is going to have to be done in partnership with all of you. Those two things, and uh, I know I'm speaking to a hometown crowd here, are really already a credit to Deputy Secretary Higginbottom. One was the decision to do a second QDDR. And I can't stress, as someone who was observing this from the outside and then came inside, how significant that was. In too many agencies, including in state, there has been a tendency to both over-strategize and under-strategize. I'm just going to be blunt. Uh, that every four years a new secretary comes in, maybe a new set of language, a new set of frameworks, that get layered on top of each other. What Secretary Clinton set out to do six years ago was to try to instill multi-year strategic planning in the civilian sector that she saw having been established in QDR on the defense side. And one of the things that my friends on the defense side have constantly said is, don't think we got everything right the first time. It was the fact that people knew the second one would be coming that mattered. So the idea is here that we want to learn from this. It's an iterative process. And that there was a, there was a commitment from Deputy Secretary Higginbottom and then Secretary Kerry, of course, ultimately, to say, this is exactly the sort of thing that we need to be doing year after year, from the integrated country strategy in each country, trying to get whole of government together, to regional strategy, to functional strategy, and up, and from the top down. That's how effective organizations work, uh, and that's the kind of review that needs to be done, not because everything was done right the first time, but because we are going to learn iteratively and people are going to know what's coming. The second important thing I think that they did before I arrived, for which I give them a lot of credit, was to co-locate this with the Resource and Management Office uh, that, that, had, that Deputy Secretary Higginbottom runs. I think, among other things, that shows the Secretary's faith in her and her background uh, in management and strategic thinking. Um, but I think it was also a commitment to saying, this process does not end when the report comes out. That is only a, a halfway, maybe even the, the pre-game warm-up before the real work, which is implementation. And if a strategy does not translate into how you manage an organization, uh, how you set your budget, then it's not a strategy, uh, it's a book stop, it's a door stop. And so that is what we are trying to do, and I think there's been tremendous leadership uh, on that part. Um, and I think one of the other great things about this so far has been the teamwork between state and aid. Not that there's been ever been anything but a perfectly wonderful relationship between the two organizations. Um, but as Alex mentioned, I mean, he has been all in on this. We were together in the field. He stuck with the beard. I lost it. But otherwise, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are still working this. We've been out in the field together. Um, I visited or video conference with 25 uh, posts around the world. We've been trying to get the thought leaders, et cetera. But we also know, and this is again something that the Deputy Secretary and the Secretary have emphasized, that to really meet the challenge that we have today, not only do we need you to help give us the answers to those three questions, but we can't do this without it being a partnership between the Hill um, and the executive branch. Um, it, in the same way that we're building on partnerships with the private sector, the NGO sector, uh, with trilateral partnerships around the world, the reality is when we think about the need to be more innovative and agile, we have to fix our own house, we have to look at things uh, that we can affect internally, but some of those constraints are dynamics about the political and media environment in which we work. We, a strategy is not a strategy if it doesn't translate into a budget. Again, some of those are things we can control and we need to do the tough love thinking uh, that we're trying to do internally, but that's got to be in partnership with the Hill uh, as well. And again, we're not going to solve everything in one swing, um, but we have to be having the conversation because I think we all know that we continue to do amazing work around the world, both our military but also our civilians uh, that are deployed in over 200 posts around the world. Um, but we also know we can do better, and we need to do better. We know we're not the only ones out there. Uh, in the Cold War, there was a limited number of actors who had uh, various levers that they could pull of influence. We now live in a world where there are lots of folks offering it. Um, and we need to figure out how committed we are, how much we are making a a proactive decision as elected officials on the Hill and the White House um, to the kind of investments in diplomacy and development. Why are we doing it? What are the ways we're going to do it? How are we comfortable deploying our civilian sector in a world that faces diffuse uh, threats, not just acute threats, but, uh, but more complex ones? So this is actually, I did not expect to ever say this, 
But this job has been incredibly fun for the last four months. Uh, not just compared to being on the hill, which is inside the bar real high. Uh, uh, that may have been something about the two years I spent and the dynamics of that. Um, but uh, it has been really a great uh, uh, effort and chance. I get to ask obnoxious questions and, and, and probing questions and find smart people who've been in government and out of government and seen our operations overseas and here. And I have leaders in, in state and aid who are really committed, who want to leave a legacy, uh, as was said. Uh, of a stronger organization, not for the you know ability to say that, but because we believe deeply in the need that the world is a better place when America is projecting its best values and its best strength. American people are better off when we have the strongest diplomacy and development that we can. So uh, we are in a, a discovery phase. We are listening. We are looking for ideas genuinely um, in order to try to uh, to meet that standard that is asked for us of the American people and their representatives up here on the Hill. Um, and we know that's another place where we can't do it uh, without Capitol Hill. Uh, you all, either through members or your staff or whoever, are going home every weekend and hearing from folks. Um, and we know the many challenges facing the American people. We need to be able to make our case uh, in a democracy for the importance of these issues. We believe that case is there to be made. We believe it's stronger. We're more better at the job that we're doing. So we look forward uh, to your input uh, on this, no matter how harsh or constructive it is, uh, in order to, to help us produce a second QDDR that, uh, that leaves us in a better and stronger place. So thank you very much.